grace, mercy, and peace. As we gather together here at Berea, and as we gather together throughout this uh, virtual world as we're gathered together. We gather together on this Easter season, celebrating, shouting the hallelujahs, knowing what our Lord has done for us. Sorry, it was, uh, I started just a little bit late. We got several people to kind of keep into our prayers throughout this week. Uh, let's especially keep the Zook family in our prayers. Uh, Dale Zook's mother, Mary, has passed away this week. And also, uh, uh, the Mint Longren has also passed away. And Delight Dick passed away yesterday as well. So very much, let's keep the Zook family and the Delight family very much in our prayers. And keep them, and may the Lord grant them peace and care throughout such a time as this. Also, as we're looking forward, just a reminder to everybody that we'll be having our Thursday Bible study online on Facebook Live at 1045. Uh, and our worship service on Thursday, which is somewhat different from our Sunday service, will be at 7 o'clock on Thursday. Our Sunday Bible study took place at 945 this morning, and we'll continue to have that going forward as well. And so continue to be in the Word, continuing to be in our Lord, where He leads and gathers us together as His holy people. Now, as we are gathered together in worship, we begin with our opening hymn. As it is this Easter season, remembering that Christ is arisen, He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We start with our hymn, Jesus Lives, the Victories Won.
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. All the earth worships you and gives praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds towards the children of men. Bless, O God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept her soul among the living and has not let our feet slip? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. We pray together. O Almighty and Eternal God, now that you have assured us of the completion of our redemption through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, give us the will to show forth in our lives what we profess with our lips. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the first and last verse of Christ has arisen. Alleluia. Every one of you 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, Peter bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle text comes from 1 Peter, the first chapter, as Peter, the one who just gave that first sermon that we read a moment ago, is a number of years later, giving these words and this witness to the church as a whole. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited by your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly with a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord lasts forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I would kind of ask at this time for those children that are listening. If you want to, you can come up a little bit closer if you would like, as we gather together, as we know what our Lord and our God has done. To kind of begin, I want to read this. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed. So just a thought as we're going forward. You have been born again with imperishable seed. So I've got over here. I know you all can't see that. That's why I made that image up there. You have been born with an imperishable seed. Peter's kind of sharing the word of the Lord as he's sharing what God has done. So as we're kind of all gathered around here, I can't be asking you questions because I can't hear your answers. But here's what this is talking about. It's using this word see, right? Now, all of you that are gathered here, you all know what a seed is. And here I have a kind of a cool seed. Everybody can see this seed, all right? No. But here we have a seed. And what this text is all talking about is it's saying this seed, it's using a simile, it's saying this is like our faith. Okay? So when we're taking a seed, we take a seed, 
And usually we want to do something with it. It's spring, we're doing planting, we're making gardens, we're doing all sorts of stuff. And you could ask somebody at home if you would like, just to kind of follow along, kind of put something together, and you can make and put a little bit of dirt into it, and then you can take a seed and just kind of put that seed down into the dirt. Now you can see kind of what was going on there. I took the seed, I placed it there, and I just stuck the seed down into the dirt, right? That's what God does for us in faith. We are just kind of this inanimate stuff. And God took this seed of faith. I've already put it in there. But he took that seed. He took faith. And he put it into good soil. He put faith into you. And he said, some of you through baptism, some of you through hearing God's word. And he took that faith. And he said to you, I'm going to take this seed of faith and I'm going to put it in you. Because you are good soil. You are a place God wants to put his word. Wants to put faith in there. And he puts that word into you. So that there is faith in your heart. When he talks about seed here, Peter, that's what he's talking about. Putting faith and planting in you. Now what happens after that? We'll get to that in the next couple of weeks here. Pastor has a plan. But for today, remember, God took that seed and placed it in you. And you have faith in our Lord and our Savior. So I'm going to put this up here. You will see this again in the coming weeks. Trust me. And as we're kind of here, we kind of virtually gather together and pray. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, thank you for the seed of faith. Thank you for the seed of faith that you put in me. That you put in me. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. You may go back and be seated with the rest of your family as we gather together. And please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is found according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On that Easter day, that very day, two of them, we're going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty a deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some of our company amazed us they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had seen a vision 
of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us, they went to the tomb, found it just as the woman had said. But Jesus, they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. Jesus acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road? Will he open to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed. And he's appeared to Simon. Then they told them what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And we confess what our Lord has won and done for us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, Who Are You Who Walk in Sorrow?
we look at that Easter that happened so long ago, we know of many of the stories, of many of the history that tell us of what took place on that day. We know of on Good Friday where Christ went to the cross. And as we looked on Good Friday and Monday, Thursday, we know that that happened. There's no question that Jesus died. There's no question that on that cross, the Romans made sure that happened and took place. But no matter kind of what happens, and especially when we are joyful and proclaiming and saying the Alleluia's, we know that here at that point, the empty tomb, the risen Christ, there is the crux of our faith. Right there is the center point upon which all of our faith rests. The chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and him risen from the dead. On that, we know our faith is founded and strong and as Peter says, certain in what our Lord has done. And he gives us witnesses upon witnesses upon witnesses. People try to come up with other thoughts and ideas, and they try to say, well, maybe this could have happened, maybe that could have happened. People come forward throughout the history of the church, and they've tried to put down the chief cornerstone. They've tried to put down this centrality of our faith, of the risen Christ. Some have come forward and say, oh, the uh, disciples must have stolen the body. And yet the place was sealed and protected and guarded. Some try to say, well, maybe somebody else stole the body. No. The disciples were making sure the body was in the tomb. The Romans were there, making sure that it was there. And for enemies, there was no way, if they had taken out the body of Christ from the tomb, they would have shown it as soon as the disciples said, Christ is risen. People are bring up mass hallucination and other sometimes absurd things. What we find here is God continually at work and wanting us to know for certain that Jesus is risen from the dead. He gives us witness upon witness and dozens and hundreds and maybe thousands of those proclaiming what Jesus has done. So that on this incredible holy season, we know Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And we know what our Lord has won and done for us. And he shows that the women at the tomb. And this is where we get to this gospel reading. And I kind of just want to take a moment here looking at this reading. Because as we go through this gospel reading, we have another point where they're gathered together. In the midst of this Acts text, they talk about having heard from the women that Jesus was raised from the dead. How some of their disciples went and saw it just as the women had seen it. Now, for whatever reason, having heard that Jesus is raised from the dead, you have these two disciples as they go on that road to Emmaus. And so they're going on this road, they're going on this journey to Emmaus. And that very day, so on the day when Christ was raised from the dead, that day at some point, probably in the morning, they stood up and said, we got to go home. We have something we need to take care of. We'll be back. And so they get up and they start going down that road. And they had seen all these things that had taken place. And one thing we can definitely take out of this is you look at all the disciples that were there. And it wasn't just the 11. It wasn't just the 12. These two disciples, they saw all that had happened. These two disciples and others were part of that witnesses that saw what had happened. And that Jesus Christ had gone to that cross 
was such a public thing that they thought everybody had to know what was going on. So that as they're walking and going to Emmaus, we have Jesus come to them. And so they're on this seven-mile walk. They're going to walk for about three hours, something like that. They're in no specific hurry on this part of their journey. They probably even went a little bit slower as they were talking. So they're on this journey, they're walking with Jesus, or they're walking together, and all of a sudden, Jesus catches up to them. And you can kind of imagine in your mind how that's happening. And they see this other person coming up. And you can think very rightly, these two disciples, probably very similar to Mary as she was at the tomb, as she had just been there. She saw the tomb was empty. She heard Jesus is not here. And then Jesus was over here to the side, and her mind, very logically thinking, trying to think what the next right thing to do, thinking, well, this must be the garden. And so she's at the tomb. Well, if you know what's happened, just let me know, and I'll take care of things, okay? And not until the moment Jesus is ready does he then say, Mary. And hearing her name, her good shepherd, she knew this was her rabbi, her teacher, her messiah, her lord, her God. Very similar to her, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They had heard he'd been risen, but they still didn't have faith yet. At this point, they still didn't believe. That's where we get the words in here, where we're having them talk, and they're saying, well, we were amazed. Some of our group said this. And some came and said that. <coughs> and then Jesus comes along and says, tell me what you're talking about. And so as they're going along, Jesus kind of goes forward. And then he starts listening to what they have to say. And you can tell how what happened to Christ on that Monday, Thursday, that Good Friday, and all of that, was as public, public a spectacle as could possibly have been done. Because they're asking, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know these things? It was so big, everybody knew. Everybody had heard what had happened. And a huge number of them on that day had seen Jesus upon the cross as they came through that gate to Jerusalem. And came out again. They had seen it. And here, during that Passover time when Christ had gone to that cross, Jerusalem multiplied three, four times, because it was the Passover. And you had four times the number of people as you would regularly have had. And they saw what had happened. The word spread as fast as you can imagine without. YouTube taking place, or Twitter happening. And yet, in the midst of that, here's somebody who hadn't heard. So Jesus says, tell me. So he's saying, go through all of these things in your mind again. Now Christ is keeping them at this moment from hearing what's going on and seeing it because he's got some teaching. And he knows that if he comes forward and says it, they're not going to be listening to all of what he has to say. Because they're going to be worshiping. They're going to be thinking of who this is. Jesus wants to bring them something more. And so as they're going along, he's keeping their eyes from quite seeing. And as he goes along, and they share what has happened, he takes the time. Oh, to have a, 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 a fly just listening and hearing out of all of what we hear of the history throughout Scripture, this is probably one of them that I wish more than almost at any other time I could have been. Just to listen to Jesus share with these two disciples, going through the whole Old Testament, starting with Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, going through all of the prophets, and then saying, here's all of what was promised. Let me tell you, this had to happen. I wish I could have been there. 
just to hear Jesus as he went into Isaiah and start to say, now, you remember all of this part at the end part of Isaiah about the suffering servant, about the one who will suffer all, about the one who must is above all, must become below all for us? That's why it had to happen. I want to have heard Jesus as he shares this incredible word with these disciples. And then as he shares, and as probably they talked for a couple of hours at least, pointing to all of the Old Testament, saying how Jesus had to do this for us to be forgiven. Their eyes still closed, but it still has a point to make. So as they go forward, they come to Emmaus. They're going to stop at their house. Jesus kind of going forward, but they're insistent. It's late in the evening. Stay with us. Let's keep talking. Let's keep sharing. Tell us more. Tell us more. You can hear the excitement in their building. They're going forward. You've shared with us so much. Let's keep talking. <clears throat> I've got to hear more. More. Keep telling us more. And then Christ comes, and they're gathered together. And then you get that incredible moment. In the hymn we just sang, the hymn writer says, Oh, the wonder, at the very middle of that hymn that we just sang, Oh, the wonder, as Christ is right there, and they're gathered together. And Jesus takes the bread, breaks it, and gives it to them. That moment, as he does that words, as he does those actions, their eyes are open. Oh, the wonder that's taking place right there as they see my Lord and my God very literally speaking. Now we know those were the words of Thomas. I could absolutely see those same kind of things coming out of their mouth. Literally, oh my God, this is Jesus. He is my God who has come here for me. And I, wow. And he vanishes before their eyes as he goes forward with other things to happen, other things to take place. But also make a, moment, make a point here. It was in the breaking of the bread that they saw it on that Easter morn so long ago. That kind of points us and says, when Jesus was there in that upper room, and when he was starting communion, and he was instituting communion, and all of those things were happening, it wasn't just the 11, it wasn't just the 12. These two were probably right there. There were other disciples Men and women, they were probably also right there when all of that happened. And they saw all of what took place on that day as he took the bread. And when Jesus does that same thing, this is given for you. You see those words given and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Seen that, having their hearts burn within them, having that come forward. You can see the excitement that starts to take place. You can see where they're going as all of a sudden Scripture says that very hour, you know, not someday, not in a couple of hours, or not, let's finish dinner, or it's kind of, oh my, back to Jerusalem. Remember, it was towards evening, it was probably dark at this point. So what? We got to fly back to Jerusalem. We got to go back home. We got to home Jerusalem with the other apostles. And we know where they're going to stay. We don't have to search house to house to find them. We know where those disciples are going to be. They hustle back. They go those seven miles. Almost, I would say, in a sprint, almost. As they're going back, we got to let them know what's happened. And they come forward. And they get to that place. They come to that place. They find the apostles quickly. 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, somewhere in that vicinity. Exciting. Incredible. Look at this. And now we have seen them go from unbelief, some people told us this, to my Lord and my God, we got to share. 
we got to tell. we got to let others know what has happened to us. And so they go to those disciples. And you can imagine almost a little depression happens for a moment as they come in, knock on the door. It's still locked for fear of the Jews, Jewish leaders. And they come forward, knock on the door. Who is it? Okay, let them in. And you have these disciples come on in. And then they come in with all the other disciples that are gathered there in that upper room. And as they're gathered together, they want to tell them what's going on. But before that happens, let us tell you. We saw him risen from the dead. Peter did. The women did. Christ is risen. And we hear this incredible joy. As then those two are able to say, yes, he is. Let's tell you what happened to us. Imagine hearing all of that. He's risen. He's risen. We saw him. We saw him. We know this is an absolute. He is risen from the dead. And it's not just 10. It's not just 11. We have these disciples. We have other disciples. We have men. We have women. All of them seeing Christ raised from the dead. And at one point, hundreds seeing Christ raised from the dead. As he even came in the very next moment. Thomas probably not being there at this point. But coming forward to everybody. And now that they've shared with one another. He appears to these two disciples. To the others that are gathered. And says, peace be with you. All of that. That joy. That incredibleness. That sharing. Now this peace. This word, this breath, this spirit of God waking upon them, strengthening their faith. He could have done it in a lot of ways. But he wanted us to know that Christ is risen from the dead. And some people do come forward, try to put down the faith, put down what our Lord has done for us. That does happen. He wanted us, in the words of Peter, to know for certain that this Jesus Christ, who was dead, and everybody knew it, is risen from the dead. And you had not two or three witnesses. You had a crowd of tens and dozens and hundreds that knew Christ is raised from the dead. So when people come up with these other ideas, they try to come up with any idea except the most reasoned and rational answer. And that is what we proclaim this day. Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
separation. We ask that you will keep us strong in faith towards you, strong towards that resurrection, strong towards the bright alleluias, and help us to be faithful and sharing with others of what you have done and given to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring forward into your hands, O Lord, those prayers that have been brought online during this worship service. We pray for the family of David Herman, son-in-law of Kevin, who died suddenly Thursday, leaving a wife and three children. We ask, O Lord, that you would be with the family of David Herman. Bless them and keep them, O Lord, in you. We ask, O Lord, that you would be with the family of Delight Dick. We know that she resides in that heavenly kingdom as you care for her and watch over her. Bless her family, O Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you'd watch over the family of Mary Sook and Demont Wandry. Guide them, Lord, lead them, and bless them as only you can bless them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask the Lord that you be with all of those who are suffering with, the, with this virus that has struck this world. But especially lifting up Jerry, John, and Brandy into your hands. Watch over them, bless them, O oh Lord. For those who try to find an answer to keep us healthy, bless them in their work. For those who try to comfort those who are sick, who are hurting, who try to find the immediate answer to be with us in the midst of this time, Bless them. And for all of those who are sick and hurting with everything else in this world, we lift up into your hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would watch over Agnes, Vern, Mar, Barb, Ladeen, Andrew, Esther, Jeff, Catherine, Jack, Esther, Larry, George, Terry, Heather, David, Sue, Lil, Michael, Millie, Lois, and Ryan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our friends. We pray for our family. We pray for our neighbors. Watch over us as we step forward to help those who are in need. As we ask you to keep us and keep them safe in your hands. But we also, Lord, lift up into your hands, Mike. Jim, Elaine, Warren, Norma, David, Marilyn, Mark, Jennifer, Anita, Steve, Mabel, Jean, Marlis, Debbie, Steve, Jackie, April, Amy, Doug, and Joan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with all those who share your word during a time like this. But especially we lift up our missionaries, be with Chris, Josh, and Ruth and their family. Bless and keep them. Watch over all of our elected officials, Lord. Give to them a servant's heart. Grant to them your wisdom and give them the strength to follow in your will. Especially we pray for our president and vice president, our Congress, Supreme Court, and judiciary, our governor, our legislature, and all of our elected officials. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray in the words in which you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. We sing together our closing hymn, Now, 
All the vault of heaven resound. Christ is risen. 